success, uh, the sheer pragmatism of what we've done and accomplished in Georgia, uh, which is reported in the book back there on the table, uh, is more a testimony to God's faithfulness, because really that's what it's about, is a return back to the first principles of the pro-life movement, in, in a sense that we recapture the passion and faithfulness of God's intent and purpose through the church, through the church. So we are unashamed. Personhood USA is a faith-based organization. We are Christ-centric. We are gospel-oriented. We are uh, open to all denominations and uh, within, you know, what we would call the, the right to life model. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce what we're doing. As soon as I tell you that I am um, the president of Georgia Right to Life, I am a national board member for National Right to Life, as well as the national field director for Personhood USA. So I sit on the board of National Right to Life. Many of you know Father Frank Pavone. Is that a name that's yes, familiar Pavone. to most of you? Father Frank uh, heads up the 115 Forum, and I'm a member in good standing of the 115 Forum where we share, challenge one another, iron sharpening iron, trying to develop leadership strategy for our time. It's not just our country. It's uh, an international movement. Personhood USA has an office here in New York, two blocks from the UN, that handles all of our international work. We're very active in Ireland right now. In fact, we've been underwriting and promoting the, uh, the whole movement over there for the last three months uh, as part of uh, our efforts to push back the pro-death, pro-abortion forces in the government. And by God's grace, we have been successful in doing that. In fact, we sent out the nation's first ever robocall into Ireland they had never received a robocall. We get them all the time in political issues. And uh, we turned out 1% of the entire country came to a pro-life event, filled the streets of Dublin. Politicians were shocked by the sheer number of people that uh, <coughs> were expressing their support of the sanctity of life in, there in Ireland and to continue the policies. Um, <coughs> The thing that I'm probably the most proud of is that I am the grandfather, father to five children, all, all of them beautiful couples, and uh, 26 grandchildren. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm very, very blessed. And uh, since the passage of my wife seven years ago, I live with a family of eight grandchildren, all under 12. So it keeps me young, keeps me active, and keeps me away from home a lot. So just, just for the peace and quiet. But we're we're going to go ahead and just have a quick introduction of the organization known as Personhood USA and what it's all about. I think it's one of the most important issues we face. It affects everything. Abortions. Cloning. Euthanasia. Assisted suicide. Stem cell research. Eugenics. When do we have value? 
Who decides? Is it influenced by age, race, or ability? Who is a person? Personhood. The recognition that all human life is precious. That every person has the right to life from their earliest biological creation to natural death. Personhood is about the foundation of our belief in the dignity of human life. And it's a look at what makes us human, what it means to be human, what rights all human beings should have. Personhood is the advancement of the Christian doctrinal position of Imago Dei, the image of God in man. It's where we ask government to recognize what God has already done, which is create an inalienable right to life for all innocent humans from their earliest biological beginning through natural death. Respect people for the simple fact that they're human beings. We don't respect a, a person, we don't take somebody's rights away because they're less intelligent than we are, or because they're not as good an athlete as we are. Part of the beauty of personhood is that there are no exceptions. You wouldn't say that a child like me who was conceived and raped isn't a person. So why should we say that an unborn child who is conceived and raped is not a person? It was during the infamous Roe v. Wade case of 1973 that the Supreme Court failed to recognize the personhood of the unborn child. The important factors that has to be considered in this case is what rights, if any, does the unborn fetus have? That's correct. If it were established that an unborn fetus is a person within the protection of the 14th Amendment, you would have almost an impossible case here. Would I you would not? have a very difficult case. Most people in today's pro-life movement don't realize that the personhood argument is not new. It grew out of the discussion at the Supreme Court level in the 70s, in the Roe versus Wade case, where personhood was central to the argument of what is the fetus. That indicates the importance of what was done in 1973, which was to separate the human being from the human person. Once you do that, it's just a question of what group you want to divest of their rights. And so, in a way, we became myopic in the pro-life movement in our vision by addressing just the issue of abortion, and we forgot about the root cause of what opened this Pandora's box, and that was the issue of personhood. With the emerging technologies, we can no longer afford to focus on the single issue of abortion. We have destructive stem cell research, we have cloning, we have human-animal hybrids, we have the complete transformation of the human genome into something other. These are dialogues and debates that we as the pro-life movement should be engaged in. Personhood USA is leading a, uh, a new movement which is using education, legislation, and political action to demand uh, a change and hopefully to spearhead a cultural shift a new paradigm, a revival in American culture where we turn away from a culture of death and embrace a culture of life. When you get involved, you can be a hero to others whose lives that you don't even know of their exact existence, but you can still recognize that theirs are lives worth saving. Personhood USA is very clearly uh, marked by organizations such as Planned Parenthood and others as the most serious threat to their uh, current modus operandi and we we believe that it's a very effective organization if you want to get involved you can just go to our website which is personhoodusa.com and click on your state there's a map click on your state see if somebody's already running a personhood group if not uh, email us and we will get in touch with you we'll help you and you could have a pro-life pro-personhood group in your state within a matter of it's not a day for us to hold back, not a day for us to hunker down. Today is the day for us to advance the message of holding the value of every person. I am a 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 person. Advancing personhood, the paramount right to life. There were several key things in the presentation that I want to um, focus in on again and just reiterate. Roe v. Wade, 1973, the argument was about
personhood. What is the fetus? If the fetus is a person, it's protected under the 14th Amendment. The argument that the justices wanted answered was, is the fetus a person or is it not? They were persuaded it was not. And so we have the ruling from Roe v. Wade that legalized abortion on demand, Doe versus Bolton companion case, based out of Georgia, by the way, uh, legalized abortion through all nine months for any reason and for all reasons. Okay, those are the facts. What most people don't realize is that at National Right to Life under Dr. Jack Wilkie of Ohio, the founder of Right to Life, personhood was the established objective of the pro-life movement, is the established objective of the pro-life movement still today. From a policy angle, a policy objective, personhood at a federal level is the goal of the pro-life movement. We need a human life amendment to our U.S. Constitution to protect all human life at its earliest biological beginning. That's the objective of the pro-life movement. Nobody out there disagrees with that. That's a given. Where the differences come in and have come in through the years is how do you accomplish that? What's the best way to go about it? For 10 of the first 14 years of National Right to Life's existence, personhood was their annual national resolution. We are calling for Congress to uh, initiate a human life amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That was the resolution at the beginning of the entire movement back in 1973. <coughs> 77, there was a debate. Nellie Gray pulled out and began the, the March for Life and instituted what's called the Life Principles. Nellie Gray is uh, the God, grand, grand dame of the pro-life movement that we all know and love. She was a good friend of mine. She asked me to speak this year at the National March for Life in, in D.C. and then got called home to be with the Lord two weeks later. So uh, somehow the, the rest of the committee missed the memo. But uh, the, the bottom line is that we are seeing a generational shift. It's been 40 years, <coughs> biblically a generation. And the leadership that was established in the early 70s are now in uh, a position to begin turning this over to the younger generation. And we're seeing the younger generation come in droves, David B. Wright of 40 Days for Life. Many of you have participated. Uh, Lila Rose, the undercover sting that she does. Um, Rebecca Kiesling, who, whose ministry saved the one uh, as a product of rape. Her father was a serial rapist. Uh, horrendous violence against her birth mother. And yet, we're glad that she's here. You know, Jesus said it himself that he would leave the 90 and 9 and go and save the one uh, so that none would be lost. And that's, that's really what we're saying today. And so the movement as such uh, has experienced uh, a lot of dialogue and debate through the, the decades as to the best way to accomplish uh, our objective, which is a human life amendment. I know at a national level, we're always in uh, debate as to what's the best approach politically, legislatively, uh, and so forth. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say what needs to be said here. We're returning to first principles in the movement. Personhood USA is a return. The personhood movement is a return to first principles, meaning that education is our primary objective. We say that there's three things that will change the culture. Education, education, education. I mean, it's like real estate, real estate, real estate. Same thing, same three things. How do you educate the culture? How do you win hearts and minds? Mother Teresa said it so well. She said, God has not called us to success politically or even legislatively. He's called us to faithfulness. That's what we're called to. And that's where we as a group are returning back to first principles in believing that, number one, God has called us to faithfulness. And that means standing where he stands 
stands on the issues, not where the politicians stand or are asking us to stand with them. So many times we find ourselves at odds politically. Back in the year 2000, Georgia Right to Life was, uh, we had 3% of our legislature in Georgia identified under the national right to life definition of being pro-life, 3%. We've been in existence as a pro-life organization for 27 years. And we had 3% of our politicians, and we had no pro-life law on the books. We came in in the year 2000, we completely changed our approach, we identified some of the things that we were doing that was wrong. We instituted an educational program that led to a political action program. We removed rape and incest as an acceptable position for politicians to take. All hell broke loose at that point, uh, you know, and they told us that we would set back the pro-life movement, that we would never have any seat at the table ever again, that we were pariahs, that we were extremists, that the press would call us extremists. Now, who told us that? All of our oh. pro-life friends <laughs> and organizations told us that. By eight months later, we had swept the entire Georgia GOP executive board. Every member of the Georgia GOP executive board was not only pro-life, but they were pro-life without exception and they were pro-personhood, signed affidavits from every one of them. At that point, the party woke up, then the politicians began waking up. We got a plank in our Georgia GOP platform declaring personhood as the uh, objective of the pro-life movement in Georgia. And now today, by God's grace, 68% of our senators are without exception there are no exceptions in 68% of our legislature. Nine out of nine statewide offices elected statewide, governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, every single one of them is pro-life without exception and pro-personhood amendment to the Georgia Constitution. Every one of them. We're the only state in the nation that can make that claim. It was at that point that we were asked, how are you doing this? How are you accomplishing this? 3% to this amazing result in less than 11 years, 10 years? And that was the beginning of the personhood movement as such, is to take this model and expand it into other states. We're in Mississippi, Colorado, uh, North Dakota, you heard the wonderful things coming out of North Dakota. There are seven pro-life bills, six pro-life bills that we've been working on. I testified in committee last Thursday before the House committee, and uh, we are seeing a heartbeat bill that was passed Friday mm -hmm. that has no time limit on it. 18 days is legally when it can be enforced. That's before a woman even knows she's pregnant. Uh, it's an effectual ban on all abortion, right? there in North Dakota. We have a fetal pain bill that, that's coming up. We have two personhood bills that will be voted on Tuesday, and I'm leaving here tomorrow to go back to North Dakota to shepherd those through the legislature there. They will, at the end of this session, next week, have passed more pro-life bills than any other state in history in, in, in a short period of time. Nobody will have done as much as the state of North Dakota. One of which is going to be a ballot initiative placed on the ballot by the legislatures, Lord willing, that will identify human life as being recognized by government and protected under law as the first state in the nation. So we're, we're, we're very much looking forward to that. And I, I, I say these are Empir the empirical data is there in the book back there. If you're a data person and you just want to see the facts and the raw year on year on year, here's what happened, here's how it happened, um, it's there. But it was God doing amazing things behind the scenes that we couldn't claim, that we couldn't take credit for, 
uh, the miracles that we have seen has been clearly a spiritual battle of spiritual forces, and we're prevailing by God's grace. So this is something I believe will work in any state, in any state. There are questions of pragmatism that have to be addressed. How does this work? What does it look like? And so forth. Now, that's just a short introduction into what is clearly a movement right now to return back to our roots in the early 70s and re-envision and re-establish a pro-life movement that is first faith-based, second uncompromising, third politically savvy and effective, and then of course uh, the end goal is legislation protection for the preborn, the elderly, the disabled, the infirm. We have to expand it into the emerging technologies and we'll be touching on that briefly. And what I want to do is tell you why this is important. We're going to go through just a brief presentation here. And I apologize for some of the uh, um, pictures that you will see uh, because ideas have consequences. And as I testified before the House committee last Thursday, I believe we've turned a corner as a nation, and it was not a good corner. On January 23rd, I'll be posting what that event was, but it changed our nation dramatically, even more so than Roe v. Wade. And uh, it's imperative that we grasp the importance of our time. And I'm so glad and pleased and blessed that the young people are rising to the occasion because the younger generation is more pro-life than we were, you know, at their age. And that is our hope. Our hope is that God in his mercy will grant us uh, uh, a move that will change hearts and minds all across this country. I do a uh, three-hour presentation for the groups that have elected to become personhood affiliates to give you in-depth uh, data and dialogue on the history of, of the pro-life movement, not just uh, you know in the present day, but our past history going back literally centuries. This church has been involved forever in this issue and why it's important to any culture, pagan or otherwise. We've seen the pagan Roman Empire captured for the sanctity of life. We've seen the pagan German culture captured, Scandinavian, you know, the Viking thing. Uh, all of that changed overnight when confronted with the truth and of the sanctity of life of man being created, Imago Dei. We, we use an illustration of a building, and this is not intended to be a temple, it's intended to be a government building, which is what it is. It's the edifice of government, of culture. And it's held up on a, by pillars that are essential uh, that we understand what those pillars are, set on a foundation that is not a road. <coughs> because, you know, you have a problem that if the erosion takes place or a pillar is destroyed, of course, the respect for the sanctity of life and human dignity collapses. And that is where our concern is with the movement, per se. If we're only involved in working with the GOP and or our only strategy is getting senators elected who will then approve the right type of judges, president and senators, that strategy has not served us well over the last 40 years. In fact, it hasn't been successful, even when we've had all the stars line up. So we have a different strategy, and it's based on a separate foundation that, that we're going to go into. I want to take you into a little uh, uh, back in history, a little history lesson. This is Hadamar, Germany in 1920. Now, for those of you who know your history, that's 11 years before the rise of the National Socialist Nazi Party. That's a, Hitler's in jail. He's writing Mein Kampf about this time. He's not well-liked, and the culture is certainly not paying attention to him at this point. 
This is Germany, post-World War I Germany. Uh, they were, they lost the war. The uh, uh, fact of the matter is the Allies, under a reparation scheme, punished them very heavily uh, financially, made them pay back the entire cost of the war, both sides, and it destroyed their economy. Their, their economy was in shambles. You've seen the pictures of the wheelbarrows full of Deutsche Marks that it took to buy a loaf of bread and, and so on and so forth. There's only a few heads here shaking. My father said that. That's why he came. There you go. There you go. Uh, ideas have consequences. And the ideas that led to uh, where they were and where they've been uh, is just as germane today as it was then. Germany, 1920, you had socialized medicine. What do you do in uh, a uh, post-war economy where money is tight, medical resources are tight? Well, you ration healthcare. You have to. There is a rationing that takes place. And they were, they were debating this back in uh, the 1920s, and it was a prominent scholar of criminal law and a noted psychiatrist who actually argued for the economic savings of eliminating useless eaters. Useless eaters. Now, who were these useless eaters? Now, these are people that were born, but uh, they have to be quantified somehow. They were the children with extreme disabilities that were born anencephalic with Potter's syndrome where their organs were outside the body. It's a fatal condition still today and one that understandably uh, is extreme. Uh, and so they used extreme cases to build a public policy. Now we see this everywhere we go, speaking before legislators, in committees, the American Medical Association comes and, and argues the extreme cases against our pro-life principles. And, you know, we're stuck with saying extreme cases makes bad law. Right. Uh, well, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is they identified a class of human life that was expendable. And so they went in school buses with the windows boarded up to collect not anencephalic children that were born with this deep disability. They expanded the class to include deaf and dumb children, toddlers, young people. And they would collect them in these buses and carry them to Hadamar where they were classified they were told, the parents were told, it is the best medical care we can afford that your child will receive under our hands. And instead, what they did after they, uh, they collected them, they expanded it to chromosomal anomalies such as Down syndrome, the incurably ill, then they began emptying the mental asylums and then they expanded it to the blind, deaf, and dumb children. And then it became a new science of eugenics. And they evaluated everybody as to whether or not they were half-breeds or not. They're breeding. And they were included. And then, of course, you have the Holocaust. This is what we call a slippery slope. The slippery slope argument begins with an extreme and then expands the class at some point. Up to 100 victims a day arrived in these buses. They were told to disrobe, and then they appeared before the medical staff, and they were assigned one of three colors of rubber bands around their wrist. And they indicated three different conditions. One is take this child or adult and kill them. That was condition one. Condition two was take this child or adult kill them and extract their brain for scientific study. And the other one was extract their gold teeth for value. You know. and, th and then the parents would receive about six weeks after their child was, was removed an urn of ashes with the death
death certificate proclaiming one of 60 deadly diseases, including syphilis. You know, for a child of six years old, these were the how they dealt with, as a culture, the useless eaters of Germany. Ten years later, 20 years later, the public had had enough. It was no longer a secret program. Hitler was in power at this time. Goebel and Himmler had their propaganda machine running full tilt. They were using these human test subjects to advance human knowledge through scientific research. That's what they were doing. And then they were burning their bodies. Now, this began in 1920. That smokestack and the burning of these useless eaters, these children, was from 1920 on, years before Hitler came to power. Don't just... Hitler did not develop in a vacuum. It was ideas have consequences, and they work themselves through the culture to a known end. What town is that again? Hadamir, Germany. And all of these photos come from the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., where an entire wing has been devoted to the medical experimentations of the German scientific community on human test subjects that led to the eventual dehumanization of a number of classes of human life. Well, you know, the, the public demanded that Hitler stop this, and so he did. Even with Himmler and Goebel and all of the propaganda machine that he had in place, it couldn't stand up to public outcry. Isn't it interesting that public outcry in Nazi Germany could stand up against the invincible Nazi regime? And yet that's all it took was public outcry. The parents had had enough. They demanded change. And they got it. And they closed the whole program down. But that didn't satisfy the scientific community, who was now used to having test subjects of a human nature without informed consent. And so they had one other place they could turn, which was the uh, concentration camps by, by that time. This is a Jewish uh, inmate. Uh, nothing bad's happening to him here except that he's dressed like a German pilot in all of the pilot gear. Uh, he's got the coat on and the life vest, and he's floating in a pool of ice water emulating the North Sea, as if a pilot would have to ditch in the North Sea. How long can he stay alive? You can see the ice cubes down there in the bottom right-hand corner of the picture. Um, obviously, uh, the human body goes into hypothermia at some, a certain point, and that's in, measured in minutes, not hours. And their whole test was all the different things they could do to either revive <coughs> these Jewish subjects, uh, in, and it ultimately came to where they, uh, it included vivisection of their brain, where they had it removed without anesthesia, because that goes to the front lines, the Russian lines, to the troops. Uh, I won't show you anything pruent, but of course Dr. Joseph Mengele was the most famous violator of human rights. He specialized in experiments on twin children. And you've heard of the condition of conjoined twins, born conjoined, and how we separate them medically through the miracle of modern science. He would join twins together medically to see how that affected them psychologically and physiologically. Without anesthesia, once again, no informed consent, primarily with children. This is the epitome of German science by 1945. Justice was served, and the doctors were brought to trial. This, they had studied uh, the pagan culture of headhunting, and determined that they could shrink a human head. For whatever reason they wanted that, the Allied prosecutor, Thomas Dodd, brought this before the court as evidence of the depravity of a culture gone awry, completely awry, into a paganism that is well recognized today. 
16 of the doctors were charged, uh, that were charged were found guilty, and seven were executed by hanging. And of course, these are, this is the famous Nuremberg trials. Out of it came what we call the Nuremberg Code, which is there can be no scientific human experimentation without an expectation, a good expectation, of performing good, of a good outcome. In other words, heart transplants did involve some experimental time period in South Africa, you will recall, that was the first heart transplant. But there was an expectation having been done in the animal kingdom and through other experiments that it could be done safely with adults. And so that was a direct result of the Nuremberg Code that all nations of the earth signed on to with the exception of China, Russia, and the United States. We did not sign on to the Nuremberg Code requiring informed consent, the consent of the conformed. I'm diabetic. Uh, I'm in a drug trial for an experimental drug, uh, insulin drug. Uh, I have to sign away uh, my rights in as much as I'm informed of the risks, and I want to advance human knowledge. I want to be able to you know, uh, help advance science medically through human experimentation, but there's got to be an expectation of good for that to be successful. Okay, now we're going to move into the modern age, and I'm going to look back here to the young people in our midst, because the blogosphere. How many of you have blogs out there on the internet? Anybody? Yes! We've got one. The, the blogosphere, uh, it's where you set up your, your web page and you identify yourself and what you're interested in. And then people engage dialogue with you back and forth. Godwin's Law came out of this new internet universe that we have. I'd never heard of it. But evidently, in a dialogue on a blog, the longer the dialogue goes between two parties arguing back and forth, the more likely it is that one side or the other is going to accuse their opponent of being Nazis. <laughs> that's, that's Godwin's law. That's, and, and it's an automatic admission that I'm throwing in the towel. You win. I lose, you win, but you're Nazis. That's, that's what I want to leave you with. Okay, this Godwin's Law uh, is whenever in a discussion we compare one side's beliefs as being held by Hitler or the Nazis. Now, you know, this is coming from the source of all wisdom and truth, which yeah. is Wikipedia. <laughs> it goes on to say in Wikipedia that Godwin's Law itself can be abused as a distraction when the analogy actually fits. In other words, you know, it only fails in one point, and that's when it's true. That the analogy of one side is that they're acting in that same manner. I'm going to take you to a uh, front cover of Discover magazine. Science, technology, and the future is the tagline for Discover. Anybody get Discover in here? Uh, subscription? This is from the May 2012 front cover that says, the organ harvest proceeded over the objections of the anesthesiologist who saw the brain-dead donor react to the scalpel. It's called a cadaveric wow. donation. Problem is, the definition of cadaver is not dead, it's just mostly dead, okay? And in many cases, People have come out of comas under these circumstances. In fact, uh, one of my legislators in Georgia experienced this exact thing. And we were hearing testimony on a new medical uh, order that could be posted on a refrigerator. And he said, you would have killed me if it hadn't been for my God-fearing wife who objected to my organs being harvested I'd be dead today. He was in a coma for over two weeks and came out of the coma, but had been declared brain dead by the medical community, and his wife was 
asked if she would donate his organs to benefit others. Mm -hmm. An altruistic appeal that many of us find attractive. I hear that now, when they har before they harvest organs, they inject a paralyzing drug because it upset the nurses if the body jumped around when they were losing organs. This is, uh, was a, enough concern for a liberal magazine to make it their front cover issue. It was, it's amazing that they would highlight, a, a take on the American Medical Association and some very powerful lobbies to point out a problem that exists today. I mean, isn't the human vivisection, how is that any different by definition when we remove from a living body? Uh, I lost my brother uh, in a motorcycle accident when he was 20, 20 years old. And they came to us and declared him brain dead and said we'd like all of his young organs, 20 years old, uh, please, his heart and his lungs especially. And we said, sure, go ahead and take them. We, we, we're glad to be of help to others. I'm sure he would want the same thing. Well, I'm sorry, okay, but we just need you to know that we have to list the cause of death as heart failure when we remove a beating heart. And we, we just, we, we shut down at that point because then you're becoming complicit with evil. Evangelium Vitae is very clear as an encyclical about being complicit Doing evil that good may come is not an option that we have available to us as Christians. What about human experimentation without informed consent? This, let's just say this is a young girl. Young girl, call her, call her Rachel. Rachel had loving parents who wanted her and through in vitro fertilization treatments created her and her brothers and sisters and for whatever reason Rachel was not selected for transfer. Instead, she and her fellow siblings amassed in a cryopreserved state at the fertility clinic. And today we have 500,000 human lives in frozen cryopreservation. Now, the record for having a child born that had been cryopreserved happened a year ago, a little over a year ago, because the process has only been around 20 something years, 21 years, and so we now have an embryo that was removed from a 20 year cryopreserved sleep, transferred to its mother, and born. While its siblings